My name is Charles Pratt. I'm an assistant arts professor here at the Game Center, uh, and I'm very happy to introduce our next two speakers, uh, Josh DeBonis and Nick Mikros. Josh and Nick, I've known for a long time. Uh, they are uh, veteran game designers, but uh, more specifically, they are veteran New York City game designers, which I think uh, creates a kind of special breed. Um, New York has not always been the easiest place to make games uh, in, uh, in the world. Um, New York designers have to be very, very, especially in the early days, uh, New York designers had to be very, very flexible, very, very agile, uh, and they had to take uh, every opportunity that was uh, presented to them. Uh, Nick and Josh survived that process and now have uh, a very healthy and uh, successful careers. Uh, but they never stopped experimenting, and uh, a couple of years ago, I guess four or five years ago, they stumbled upon a design uh, first seen at um, Come Out and Play, for a game called Killer Queen. Uh, come out and play is a, a festival, a street, uh, field and street game festival here in New York. So again, very kind of New York, uh, the, the environment of New York is uh, kind of imprinted on this game and their work. Uh, after that, they took uh, this design and turned it into a somewhat uh, unusual uh, video game, arcade video game uh, for 10 people, uh, five to a side, uh, that they're going to be talking about uh, today. Uh, I think mo just as importantly though, uh, as stumbling upon this design that's been pretty successful for them, they stumbled upon a kind of uh, a, a revival uh, of certain spaces uh, that we had all maybe thought were gone. Uh, and those are arcade spaces, uh, public spaces where people come together to play video games uh, and now at least uh, drink uh, and have fun. Um, it's maybe hard to imagine, and I know that it certainly caught me by surprise that um, arcades are actually popping up all over this country. Uh, we've all gotten kind of used to the idea that those spaces were gone. They died out in the late 90s, early 2000s. But in fact, they are seeing something of a revival, and Killer Queen has uh, somewhat... Uh, uh, you know, uh, sur not surreptitiously, what's the word I'm looking at? It's the synchronicity, maybe? There's, there's some kind of synchronicity that Killer Queen has come around about the same time that the, the U.S. is experiencing this revival. And Nick and Josh have kind of, once again, in, in New York City game designer fashion, somehow found this niche, right? Somehow stumbled upon this uh, small little ecosystem that uh, most other people uh, may have overlooked. And uh, they're going to talk about, in addition to Killer Queen, what it means to design uh, for uh, an actual, real, living and breathing arcade space. So I'll leave it up to Nick and Josh. So this is the title of our talk, <laughs> Killer Queen Sucks uh, Because It Can't Be Played by Monkeys. Uh, and my wife keeps pointing out that that's not a monkey, it's actually a gorilla, but use your imagination, I hear you have one. Uh, so we were recently told by a very important arcade developer's head of sales that uh, their company's games were way better than Killer Queen because uh, uh, it could literally be played by monkeys. So we were a little bit astounded by that statement, um, but it really is the prevailing attitude of uh, the arcade industry as it stands now, and we're hell-bent on changing the landscape. So uh, this is how we originally envisioned the game. Uh, it was going to be a festival game. Uh, people are playing with NES controllers, and they're looking at a projected screen. So, uh, but through an odd series of events, we were actually destined to have this game be in arcades. Uh, the problem was that we had no idea how to make that transition, and we had no mentors. We didn't know anybody in the arcade industry. Um, so this talk is really about all our research and ex experimentation to go from you know, a festival game that would be played at like IndieCade or, you know, whatever, uh, to something that can stand alone in an arcade. So our outsider status uh, and our lack of history really took us in a wildly different direction than where the industry was actually at. Okay, so uh, these two games are uh, modern arcade games. That's what they look like today. Um, they're oversized. 
they're gaudy, uh, and the gameplay focuses on one-time thrill rides. They've got a lot of specialized controls, like there's a motorcycle on this one, there's like a, a light gun in the other one, and um, they effectively uh, make the best use of affordances one could imagine, right? So, uh, I mean, what could be a better affordance for riding a motorcycle game than actually sitting on a motorcycle, right? Uh, but it also makes that experience difficult to reproduce at home. So that's really their kind of business model. Uh, but when we started the project, our mental model was based on our experiences as players in the 70s, 80s, and 90s in arcades. And so uh, uh, it was, it, you know, the games that we were thinking about were games like this. And, but simultaneously, we had both been working in uh, small scale, downloadable, and online games uh, for modern audiences. So both of these influences basically reverberated through every element of the design. Um, we've ended up with an arcade game that is super successful in barcades and is trying to find a foothold in more traditional, casual uh, family entertainment centers. Um, but had we come out of the arcade industry mostly based in Chicago, uh, maybe our game would have looked more like this, right? This is uh, Pac-Man Battle Royale. It's a four-player multiplayer game. Um, and maybe it would have uh, found more of a home in family entertainment centers and been rejected by the largely hipster community that attends barcades. Okay, so regardless of the style uh, and the audience, in order to convert Killer Queen to a functional arcade machine, uh, we had to design arcade-specific elements, uh, the control panel, the marquee, an attract mode. We had to come up with some kind of business model for this weird 10-player game. Uh, we had to instruct players on how to play the game, because we weren't going to be there like we are in festivals. And all this design ultimately uh, is constrained by the realities of uh, manufacturing and also about making these machines easy to repair. So one of the first things that we added was the attract mode, which is a bit of a lost art. The attract mode is uh, the part of the game that displays while no one is playing. And it serves a few functions. One is to catch your eye over all the games in the arcade uh, that are pretty bright and loud. So it needs to be bright and loud, and it needs to have a lot of contrast between the sound and the visuals, and uh, it's not only on the monitor, but it's also in the display lights, et cetera. Okay, the, other th the second thing it needs to do is educate the players about the game and also do a little bit of world building. Um, tell the players this is the universe that you're in, which in our case is a really weird universe. Um, and last but not least, we have to convince the players to put money in the machine. Okay, so let's dissect our first, our, our current attract mode. Uh, it's split up into some, uh, into highly contrasting segments of 15 seconds a piece. All right, hold on, I have to jump out here for a second. Okay, so this is what we call the main attract screen. It's epic, it's colorful, um, it's kind of retro because of the pixel look. It's also highly based on the X-Men uh, 1992 arcade game. Uh, yeah, so, um, and uh, basically we, uh, we also, so this is the video part now. And so we noticed that when players, uh, where there were no players on the machine, it was really hard to get a game going. So we decided to ne do the next best thing, which is just show a bunch of people playing the game in the attract loop, kind of taking the Wii U approach to, um, to the attract loop. It's also, um, you know, it looks a little bit more modern. Um, okay. 
Okay, so this is the uh, gameplay part of the attract loop, and it's supposed to show players how the game is played in an actual game. Uh, this this, act this uh, part of the attract loop currently uh, used to be a little bit longer. Now it's a little bit shorter so that it contrasts with the other parts more. But what we've kind of figured out is that it's a little bit too short. Players don't have enough time to kind of understand what's going on in the game, but more importantly, they don't have enough time to explain to other players what's going on. So that's gonna be a change that we're probably gonna be making soon. Okay. Okay, here's some more uh, video of players. Uh, it lets you know that it's a team game. You'll notice there's a lot of cuts between the orange and blue. It also shows the two cabinets back to back. Um, it also, yeah? Shows people drinking. Yep, it shows people <laughs> drinking, which is a very important part of the game. Uh, it also uh, reinforces that 20-somethings um, play this game. And 20-somethings uh, are cool. So if you want to be cool, play this game. Right? Because as everybody knows, everybody wants to be 25. If you're younger than 25, you want to be 25. If you're older than 25, unlike me, uh, you want to be 25. Okay. Okay, so this is what we refer to as the white screen. So this... Um, this part of the attract loop was meant to explain some of the harder to understand concepts of the game. Uh, a lot of people, especially initially, uh, didn't really understand that it was a team game or that they were playing against the other, the other cabinet. Uh, so uh, it says, meet thy families. We wanted a, like a warm, welcoming message. And we also are showing like, oh, hey, there's a gold team and there's a blue team. Okay, so in this section, we're teaching the player how to, how to become a guy that jumps like Mario into a guy that flies. And he walks into this thing we call a gate, nothing happens, he picks up a food, he goes in there, a transformation happens. Okay, and now he starts flying. So you'll notice it says Path of the Warrior. So a lot of players were confused, they didn't understand that when they started flying, they can also fight now. So that's, it's, it's in the arc of the flight pattern, and so you can't really miss it. Okay, so in this section, we're teaching you what the role of the queen in the, in the game is. And you'll notice that the gate is uh, gold. So this little worker has picked up a, um, a, a fruit, and he goes in there, but nothing happens, right? Until the queen comes and blesses it to blue. And then the transformation happens. Okay, at this point, we knew that a lot of our players didn't, or a lot of the early players didn't really understand how to kill, because most of them had never even heard of joust, let alone play it. So we're trying to explain that you can kill from above and from behind. Okay, uh, that last little part, we're also explaining that the queen has a special move, which is the dive. Okay. Okay, the next thing we had to do was uh, add a control panel, design a control panel, which is something that we had never done. And you'll notice there's no super superfluous controls in Killer Queen. It's basically a joystick and a button. And in fact, outside of the queen stick, sorry, outside of the queen stick, all the other players are gated, so they can only move left and right. Um, okay. And each player also has a picture of who they're playing in the game. A, a lot of the complaints early on were, I don't know who I am. So, uh, and believe it or not, 
so many of our, so many people come up to us and say, you know what would be a great idea? If you put a picture of the player, your character, of the, of the character you're playing in front of you, and of course we did, and we'd say, just look down. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Okay, uh, so the other thing was that we needed to fit five players in a very compact space. If any, uh, if any of you know about arcades, especially barcades, there's very, very limited floor space. They're trying to like fit as many games as they can in there. So even though everyone thinks that Killer Queen is an enormous game, it's actually quite compact for the function that it has to serve. Okay. Oh, wait. <coughs> okay. So, uh, what we did here was um, you'll notice that the controls are also staggered. Uh, all the controls that are on the yellow parts are closer to the player. All the parts that are on, all the controls that are on the white parts are further away. So the effect is you have people kind of zigzagging around. You'll also notice that the players on uh, the corners, the angle of the sticks is about five degrees off to tilt their bodies a little bit more so that they fit, they interlock a little bit nicer. Okay. Okay, kids. Everything Grandpa Nick has been telling you <laughs> is true. Um, but this, all this stuff that he's been talking about applies to all the older existing arcade games too. So I want to fill you in on some of the things that we've been doing that sort of push the envelope of what an arcade game can do in a way that the arcade establishment is reluctant to do or afraid to do. So first, um, we are treating this as a, a living game. We're always adding new content, which is very, uh, very different than how most of the other arcade manufacturers work, where they put out a game, test it out, and if it's earning well, they'll manufacture a large number and then, and then ship those and they're done with it. Our, our uh, process and our goal is to keep adding new content and iterating on the game uh, based on the needs of the community and the desires of the community. This is a new map we've been testing out. Um, also, we received a lot of pressure from the family entertainment centers to put in, uh, uh, put in AI so that it could be played with fewer than 10 players. And we were very reluctant to do that initially because one of the great things about the game is when you have less than 10 people, you go recruit other people to come play with you and uh, not only do you teach, teach people the game, but you make new friends. And so, but we did, we did realize that sometimes there's just not 10 people to play with and the game feels better and plays better when, when it's full. So I think we came up with a great solution. It's a good compromise of the two. It's uh, Mr. Bumblebot. You can follow him on Twitter for, for, for real. Um, and um, so the way he works is he only works as a worker. He will pick up berries and ride the snail. He'll never become a soldier. And he, uh, is, he's ruthlessly efficient, but he's also very robotic. So it doesn't have the same type of personality as a human player. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't replace a human player. He just kind of fills it out and makes the game feel alive. It makes all the victory conditions viable with fewer players but it's just, not, uh, it's just not the same experience as having a real player. So it, it, as far as we've been able to see, it doesn't impact the vir virality. Um, also, a lot of the work that we've done is not necessarily game design, but it's more about creating a context for the game to live within. So part of that is uh, making a very deliberate decision not to have a home version of the game. So you have to coordinate over Facebook with all your friends to get out of the house, get your ass down to the barcade, and then meet five strangers there to play, and by the end of the night, hopefully you have five new friends or more. And so that, I mean, that's been a very deliberate effort, and it seems to be working really well in creating a great community. The established arcade industry, they see the arcade owners as their only customers, and they have little or no regard for the players. But I think like probably most of you, Nick and I see the players as, uh, that we put the players first, that's, that's our priority. 
And so we do a few things to a few things differently than other other arcade games. First, we assume that our players are very smart, and we assume that they have some game literacy. We also try to empower our players as much as possible. The Killer Queen community really feels DIY in a way. Everybody that's part of the community contributes in some way. And it feels like a family. It feels very collaborative. Nick and I are just a, a very small part uh, that kind of got the game going, but everybody else uh, keeps, it, keeps it going. Um, they're very active on social media, not necessarily to share it with the, the out with non-players, but to communicate with each other. They're, they use Facebook to communicate all the time within a city and across cities, and there's a very active Slack channel as well. I think there's a uh, disproportionate amount of fan art and the quality of fan art, considering how small our community is, and they also make a lot of fan merchandise, which we encourage them to, to make and sell. And um, the, our only requirement is that it, we tell them that it must be transformative if they're using like our assets. And that, uh, that helps them create better art. And it seems to be working well. And we, uh, we also purposely leave gaps in the, the backstory and the names for the characters. We purposely don't give anything an official name. And everybody comes up with their own names that are, tend to be regional. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting point of discussion between different players. Um, also for, uh, we just had our national championship. And we asked all of the scenes to make a video introducing themselves. And amazingly, al almost all of them did. And they were all really high quality. This is one of my favorites. This is the one from New York. He's there just to take good care of me Like he's one of the family Charles <laughs> in charge of our days and our nights Charles in charge of our wrongs and our rights And I see Uh, and so there was uh, maybe eight or nine other videos of equal caliber from all the, all the cities. And everybody just did this because they wanted to be part of, of this community and share what they have in their hometown. It was really amazing. Um, so the, the players have, have turned this into an eSport, which we never envisioned. And so we're also trying to empower them to take it further in that direction. So um, there, we created something called KQL, Killer Queen League. This is going to be the, the player run governing body. We just, uh, for our national championship, we created an, an advisory cabinet of representatives from all the different cities that have Killer Queens. And that's going to be the basis of, uh, of this league. Uh, we're figuring out the details of how that'll work now. Um, and also, uh, to make it more of an eSport, any new game design directions were really um, we're, we're letting them lean toward having uh, as high a skill ceiling as possible. We've been writing tools that make streaming easier and um, creating a tournament mode which manages the teams and the brackets for tournaments and it inter integrates with those streaming tools. And we're also now creating player cards that lets high level players track their stats across games and it also integrates their names with the streaming and the tournament mode. Um, also, Nick and I, were an active part of the player community. We're fans of the game and players of the game as well as the developers. Um, our presence in the community is, is sort of part of the culture around it. Um, our names are on the marquee, which is very unusual for an arcade game. And we try to be present at as many events as possible and active on social media just as, you know, as a part of the community, not, not just as developers. So the fruits of all of this effort have 
they culminated last week at our national championship in, in Austin. It was a resounding success. There was 34 teams from 11 cities, an amazing level of competition, a really great family that all came together. Um, and it was very obvious to us that this effort was working because we shared the event with uh, Big Buck Hunter, with their national championship. And they're probably the most progressive of the old guard of the arcades. Um, but the difference between our community and theirs was so noticeable. And it shows that what we're doing is really working to build a new and a more engaged type of community around arcade games. Uh, this is Black Emperor. We're releasing this in 2017. It's designed by Jose Tomas Vicuña. Or T Tomas, he's the designer. It's a great game. Um, we are taking this um, in a similar direction as how Killer Queen came from a festival game. This was originally slated to be a mobile game, so we're doing a lot of the same types of things we did with Killer Queen to make this an arcade game, except now we actually know what we're doing. Um, so this is actually out in the lobby, so go check it out if you get a chance, if you haven't already. So working on both of these games has been incredibly challenging, but also incredibly rewarding. And we're seeing a revitalization of arcades and it's exciting to be at the forefront. So hopefully this talk has given you a little bit of insight into our process and our philosophy, and it'll encourage you to think a little bit differently about the possibility of games in public spaces. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, do you want to, there's another mic back there. All right, so I guess we'll, we'll just open up for questions. Anybody? Uh, yeah, right in the middle. Wait, wait, well, the question was, why are there three, uh, three victory conditions and would we consider adding more? Uh, well, why there are, I mean, is buried in time. But uh, I think uh, there, there are levels that we, uh, bonus rounds basically, where we do focus on one win condition. Uh, so the, the slide that Josh showed with the three snails is an all snail victory. And there's another bonus uh, round that exists in the game now, which is an all military victory. So, uh, and we are playing around with stuff like that. Uh, we've been vaguely talking about a scorpion level that will be a little bit different. Uh, so, yeah. One, one thing about the, the, I think the reason why we got to three victory conditions was we were really thinking about initially how to make it play like a Euro board game. Right. And although you know most of those games don't actually have three victory conditions, they often have multiple paths to victory. And so it was inspired by that, partially. Um, so you talked a lot about building community and getting people who are in these communities to get engaged. But there's a risk what, that, that that's missing the people who aren't already in the community. And this can create a sense of resentment that I'm not cool enough and hip enough to live in a city where there's a community. And there's a huge number of people who can't play the game that are left out because they can only play a console game because they live somewhere where there aren't 10 players. They're in a rural area. Or arcades. Not a big city. There aren't arcades. Uh, I even live in a somewhat big city, and I basically can't play the game. And I feel kind of excluded from the community. And that's... You've built What's a great community, and then you've left me out of it. No. Well, yeah, okay. so the question is about uh, what... <laughs> yeah, what, what do you do with uh, the people who don't live in uh, an urban area where a lot of the success of this game has taken place? I actually want to add to this, by the way. This, is, uh, this was also uh, something that uh, Mark Essen heard about Nidhogg. I don't know if people know the game Nidhogg. Over and over again, the whole time he was developing the final sort of Steam release was people being like, I don't go to game festivals. I can't play this. What's, what's going on? I think there's a, a couple ways. Uh, first of all, that is a concern of ours. Um, we, we don't want to ex exclude people. Um, so there's, I, I think uh, there's a couple answers. One is it is starting to become more and more popular at big events like PAX and um, uh, 
MAGFest and things like that. And, and so it becomes, our goal is to, like, maybe for it to become a little bit of a destination. Somebody to say, oh, I'm going to go to California Extreme so I can play Killer Queen. Um, it doesn't allow you to become a regular player, though. That's, that's one challenge. Um, we're, we're, one thing we're experimenting with is a different uh, format that's kind of a little bit more like that Pac-Man Battle Royale that we showed that we think might work better in more uh, suburban areas. Um, and we don't know yet, but we want to test that. And then um, also we're, one thing, another experiment that we're trying, uh, which is kind of related, is we, are, we do want to make a home game that is set in the same world, but it's a different uh, type of gameplay. Uh, that well, right now we're calling it Killer Queen Tactics. It's a turn-based strategy game, but it's set in the same world, the same basic tenants, but uh, but it's not competing with the main game. So uh, it, I know that doesn't it doesn't really allow everybody to play it, but I think that's that's sort of uh, an unfortunate you know side effect of some of the great things that are coming out of it just being an arcade game. I, too. I mean, there's also the roller coaster argument, right? It's like, well, I don't live anywhere near a great adventure. Why can't I have a roller coaster in my house? <laughs> so. But that decision is that. not arbitrary. Like, we would be a lot richer if there was a home version, most probably. Um, the, the decision isn't arbitrary. It, it, is, uh, it is deliberate. I mean, we know firsthand that it will be a weaker experience. So do we deliver something that's kind of, you know, okay, and, or, I mean, Nidhogg also got a lot of flack when it was actually released because it didn't live up to expectations. And, uh, you know, the network play just really wasn't where it should be. And this is gonna be way worse. So what's the point? <laughs> Jess, you had your head up. Yeah. So the question is about uh, maintaining a living game when you're dealing with a bunch of different stakeholders, right? Like you're, you're, you're not just uploading a patch to Steam. You are dealing with lots of different bar owners, I assume, right? Lots of different players. Uh, what are you doing to actually maintain the, the idea that this is evolving and growing uh, when it's such a sort of hyper-localized uh, experience for a lot of people? Sure. So uh, we have... Uh, the, the way that we do the, the updates is um, we, we send a, a downloadable image to, uh, to the arcades or to the, really to the operators. Whoever, whoever owns the cabinet, whoever runs the, manages and maintains the cabinet, they download it, put it on a USB stick. They just put it in the computer in the cabinet and reboot it and it, and it replaces it. So it, it is, it's a little bit more difficult than just downloading a patch through Steam or something like that. But, but we, are, uh, we are working on an online solution where it automatically just updates itself. Um, oh, yeah. As far as the local um, modifications, I think pretty much all the machines are the same. The one thing that you can change is um, in the settings. I mean, there's a lot of settings you can change, but, but one thing that makes it very hyper-local, which I love, is you can put in your, a URL for your local community to to meet up. It's usually a Facebook group. And um, also you can put in when your local league night is. So those those screens pop up in between games occasionally and those help build the community. I actually yeah, uh, okay, I just have one question actually that I'm really curious about. You emphasize community a lot, um, which makes sense because it's a ten player game. It needs a community kind of to survive. But um, you know, Black Emperor is a very different experience. That's a single player experience. Um, it's I mean, are you still thinking of the idea that, like, oh, the health of a new arcade game relies on building a kind of community of players that interacts together? Or is it just that that's what works for Killer Queen and you're thinking that, okay, something different is going to have to work for Black Emperor? I, th I think uh, we're going to have to take a very different approach uh, to Black Emperor just because it's not as social a game. I mean, it's not head-to-head. -head, so... Um, there's no way that we could 
treat it in the same way that we could treat Killer Queen, but we can learn a lot of things from what we did with Killer Queen and then kind of improvise, just like we did with Killer Queen. Yeah, I've seen with that game, uh, with Black Emperor, you get a, a very a different type of community. It's a, it's a more short-lived and local community that, that arises in the space that night. Like, we had an art, artcade a couple weeks ago, and I, like, one thing that, that was amazing to me was everybody was kind of keeping an eye on it, and then I, and somebody, I think it was Terry Kavanaugh got the high score, and like the whole room started cheering for him. And because they had all played it earlier that night, and they had kind of been invested, and they, they knew that there was like a certain part that gets, um, that get, got really difficult, and it, like they all kind of had come together, but then they are, they're not going to keep discussing that afterwards. So yeah, yeah they're it's not going to go on Facebook and say, "Hey, are you going to go play Black Emperor?" Right? But yeah. it fits within it fits within a family of games that we're trying to construct. Yeah, and also we wanted to do something very different than Killer Queen as a follow up, um, and so that I mean, it is it is obviously very different in many ways. And, and another way that I think it may create interesting conversations online is that the map changes weekly. And so uh, hopefully we're, people will kind of discuss, oh, you know, in our arcade we got to, to a certain distance, like how far did you guys get? And what, did you see the thing at, at a certain place? So yeah, there was a question in here. Yeah, go ahead. Can you talk about a little bit more about the distinction between the, the barcade atmosphere and the kind of family fun center? Is it just a matter of like hipster aesthetics that attracts one or the other? And like, what's going on with that? Uh, so the question is the difference between designing for a space like a bar arcade and a space like a, a family fun center. Yeah. It, it is really, really different. I mean, uh, um, the business model of everybody chipping in and paying one price for 10 people uh, does not fly uh, at family entertainment centers. Uh, I have a whole theory I can talk about uh, about how Killer Queen is a socialist game, <laughs> but I will spare you the details. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, the other thing is that uh, it's it just looks awkward in a family entertainment center, right? It's It, it looks very retro, and everything else looks like kind of Big, oversized and bubbly and gaudy, and uh, it just looks like oh, the the weird uh, city cousin came to town, you know. <laughs> also, one other difference is the barcades tend to give it a lot more support, which is it, as a game it needs that. Um, uh, like especially at first, it needs it needs some a little bit of help getting started, and then once it gets started, the community keeps it going. At the family entertainment centers, the operators there are much more hands off. They're used to games like like Jurassic Park that we showed. That game you can put it literally anywhere, and it just starts making money. You don't have to do anything, right? And so they're used to games like that, and they want it to behave that way, and it just doesn't. If we could make it work that way, we would, but it's just it's not that type of game. All right, uh, last question. So you talked about you know some features you want to add with streaming and player cards and stuff. Do you foresee having to like patch your hardware in the future? Uh, the question is, yes. do you foresee, foresee uh, having to actually change the hardware in addition to the software? Um, well, the the all the streaming stuff that just works now. Um, but the player cards, uh, we've been debating whether we can just um, sell it as an aftermarket thing. Uh, that you can just install onto your Killer Queen. And in fact, there's, if you look on one of the cabinets, there's like a prototype with like, it looks like there's like black notches in the front and a, and a bar. Um, that would be uh, somewhere that you would insert your card. Sure. All right, great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. <laughs>